All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the world's greatest Bronze Age Spider-Man podcast. Here comes the Spider-Cast. I'm your co-host, Michael, and as always, I'm joined by... Joshua Mervell. And today we're going to be taking a look at some of the Spidey, like, crossover event comics, I guess. Uh, some, like, the special appearances from 1987. Yeah. Not really events, more just, like, guest appearances. Right. Back before they had big events and multi-part stories. But anyway... Uh, yeah, so unfortunately, uh, Bex Luthor and G.I. Jolie could not be with us, but returning for another guest appearance is Mara. Thanks for joining us, Mara. Hi, thanks for having me. Happy to be here, Mike. Awesome. And uh, we were trying to figure out, when was the last time you think you were on the show? Do you remember? Was it like a year ago? Oh my gosh, I think it was a year ago during the pandemic. Um oh. I can't even recall exactly which which um, which comic which book we we talked about, but it was definitely last year. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, you know what? I just happened to have a Here Comes the Spider Cast database. <laughs> and, uh, oh, Mike, Mike loves flashing his database, and yeah, I don't like <laughs> to show off, but <laughs> I don't mean to brag or anything. But you know, it's funny. I, I don't know. A- database you know have you yeah <laughs> have you done spider cast or have you maybe you've only done movie reviews with us i have done the spider cast i remember um reading one of reading uh in my sofa so i'm, I'm sure we have done it okay okay oh and i definitely know you were also on um quasar chronology i remember that because remember that was when we used to do it in person i remember you came to my studio Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay, so today's books, we're going to be talking about Power Pack 29, Marvel Fanfare 32, and Marvel Tales 198. We're going to start off with Power Pack. I'm going to talk about this one. So this is written by Louise Simonson and drawn by John Bogdanove, who are the same team that went on to work on X Factor for a little while together. And they also did Superman the Man of Steel around the time of Superman's death. So... You know, they've worked together a lot for many years, and I personally love this team. But uh, Power Pack, we've done a bunch of issues already. This one's a little bit different. Um, It starts out with a a gang of kids hanging out in a schoolyard, and one of them is kind of flashing a gun around, bragging about he's going to use it to beat up Alex Power, who's the oldest member of the Power Pack. And so his friends convince him, well, maybe you shouldn't shoot the guy. And they're like, and he's like, okay, well, you know what? How about this? I'll try to fight him. And if that doesn't work, then I'll shoot him. I'm like, okay, fine. So then we cut over to the power pack, the four kids sitting at home watching TV. They're hanging out. And um, upstairs on the roof of the building, Alex Power. Oh, by the way, we should mention in a previous issue, all, of, all four members' powers have been switched around. So. Mm-hmm. They've switched around and they've changed. Uh, I think they've also changed their names. So I don't know. I personally think that's confusing, but whatever. What is wrong with it? So Alex is up on the roof and he's testing out his strength because I think in a previous story. Oh, yeah. It's because he's he's flashing back to the same fight that the other guy is talking about. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah he's trying about- to get stronger right. to kind of like. Because because the, when he last had that fight, he had his strength, his super strength, mm. where now he has a different set of power. So he's trying to build up strength. I think he also mentions to something like the powers when they kind of shifted around, they went to the person that needed that needed specific it. power. Right, so right. So he's right, trying right. to like, yeah, he's trying to like get his power back when everything kind of shuffles back around. <laughs> mm hmm. And so the kids get into an argument, and Alex is really pissed off, so he leaves. And uh, meanwhile, um, we cut over to um, to uh, the school school the next day, and Johnny Rival, who is accusing Alex Power of being a mutant, starts a fight with him. He's made these cookies for this girl, I guess, and he starts a fight with him. He's trying to start a fist fight, but Alex is trying to avoid it. Uh, meanwhile, one of the teachers comes and breaks it up. And then, um, you know, after school, uh, this girl, Allison, the one who he was going to give the cookies to, is is um, kind of like melting off to the kids. And, oh, I just love this artwork. We see that the rest of the Power Pack family walk by the kids. And just look at the on digital page nine. Look at the body language of Katie Power as she walks by. I love stuff like that, you know. Like, mm-hmm. John Paul Gunnaby is such a great cartoonist. But anyway, so... 
The next page, we, we finally see Spider-Man. And by the way, I posted these pages to a, a Facebook page and to Twitter. And I pointed out, John Bogdanovy draws the black costume Spider-Man unlike any other artist. Most artists draw the black costume as solid black with like cyan highlights. But you'll notice John Bogdanovy draws sort of a dark, dark blue Spider-Man with black shadows, which is unusual. No one else does it this way. Mm-hmm. Mm. And a few people commented they like that. And then John Bogdanove said something about it. Now he's following us. On, oh, on Twitter. nice. So that's cool. Yeah. So anyway, he's a great artist. So anyway, so Spider-Man is taking pictures of these drug dealers, I guess. Then meanwhile, behind, or sorry. So Spider-Man is taking pictures, obviously, for the Daily Bugle. But behind him, he's being spied on by the Hobgoblin. Mm-hmm. And so meanwhile, we cut, we cut, cut back over to these uh, Alex and Johnny who are now actually starting their fist fight. Johnny pulls a gun on on Alex, and he's all shocked. He's trying to figure out what to do. And uh, in the struggle, the gun ends up going off, which catches the attention of Spider-Man and the Hobgoblin. So Spider-Man swings over um, to see what's going on. Meanwhile, Hobgoblin swoops into uh, underneath this tunnel where they were fighting, and he snatches them up and basically kidnaps them. And they're, they're like struggling in the air and uh, Johnny ends up fighting. Spider-Man swings in and catches him, puts him down, and then is chasing after the Hobgoblin and Alex. And he's and, and meanwhile, Alex, even though he has his powers, he's having a hard time kind of, you know, figuring out what to do and how to use them and how to deal with the Hobgoblin. But when they finally make their way to the roof, he's just about to use them on the Hobgoblin. And then Spider-Man ends up knocking him out. And uh, Alex ends up getting kicked by the Hobgoblin off of the roof. And what what had happened was is Alex was considering killing him, right? Yes. And and then um, and then Spider Man gives him a lecture. Of course, I, I thought it was going to be a Uncle Ben flashback, but it wasn't. It was a flashback to the Gwen, death of Gwen Stacy mm-hmm. when he remembers that Green Goblin killed Gwen Stacy, and then he was tempted to kill Green Goblin, but he didn't. But then Green Goblin ended up dying anyway. But it wasn't because of him. So, you know, he kind of gives him the lecture and Alex understands. And then Spider-Man ends up going up uh, or going back to where uh, Johnny is and the cops come. And then Alex and Johnny end up kind of making up and now they're pals. And yeah. uh, Alex uses my favorite insult at the end of the story, <laughs> Yamada's mustache. I'm going to start <laughs> using that now. So anyway, so as you can see by how quickly I summarized the story, the plot is a little bit thin, but... Just like all the previous issues of Power Pack, I, I did enjoy this one. Um, June Brigman is still the quintessential Power Pack artist, but I love the art. Um, so, yeah, overall, I did enjoy this issue. But, Mara, since you're our guest, you can go first. Uh, what was your impression of this issue? I enjoyed it. Like you said, the plot was quite thin. Um, there's not very much to it, really. Um, I do find it odd to um to make a friend out of that experience you know like um the, the guy just pulled a gun on on alex so right <laughs> very difficult to form a friendship there but i guess the near death experience really brought them close together um uh-huh. but like you said the art was quite good um there were some dialogue there that i thought was better off as um bubbles as thoughts Okay. Um, because there, there was just a lot of talking. I, I found. Um, but of course, in comics, you kind of need dialogue to tell people what's going on. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I enjoyed it. That's good. Did you like the artwork by John Bogdanove? I did like the artwork. Um, I didn't even notice the Spider Man. Um, that you, you were talking about the differences. Um, I like, I looking at it. Looking back at it now, I do like that um, the Spider-Man was dark blue and black in some spots. That was um, very unique, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he's one of my favorite artists. So, yeah, I'm glad you like that. Uh, Josh, what was your impression of this issue? Yeah, this is probably the best issue of Power Pack we've read uh, so far. Mm-hmm. I love how Spider-Man is um, integrated into the story. Like he feels like he actually belongs in this one. Uh, mm-hmm. The themes definitely line up to a lot of the themes in other Spider-Man stories. So it felt like a natural fit. Um, Hobgoblin is like, I think, a perfect villain to kind of 
introduced in a story like this because he's so weaselly that it makes sense mm-hmm. that they can kind of easily write a story where he just runs away. So like the villain is, is really fun. Um, the story at times is a little like heavy handed. Uh-huh. Uh, of course it, it is like a, a kid's comic book trying to teach a lesson, but uh, I surprisingly even really like the whole like Spidey uh, taking a second to, to, you know, teach him a lesson and kind of recall a past story and, and help him learn from that. Um, I thought it really tied up the end of the, the story really well. Um, and it was also nice that it was done in like a single panel. Um, right. Good point. I do agree with Mara at times. Um, there are like just, too, there's just too much dialogue and like a lot of like thought bubbles when Spidey is introduced and he's like on the building spying on the like drug deal that's going down and then hobgoblins above him it's like more thought bubbles than there is artwork on the page like it just (laughs) overflows and it's like um it's all just information that's not necessary for the story it doesn't come back up like hobgoblin is like i'm here because i'm gonna frame a kingpin and plant evidence that he was here doing this drug deal that way, when the police, that, that way, when I call the police, he's framed. And what it's like, who who cares? We don't see this happen again in the issue. And it just feels like they're over explaining why these two characters are here. And it's like, all you have to say is there's like something fishy going on and Spider Man's taking pictures and Hobgoblin is ch- like following him. I don't think you really need that because it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with anything else that's happened in the story and it doesn't come back later on and and maybe this will later on in like a different issue like a future issue of amazing or something but uh it just feels unneeded and again just kind of uh it makes it 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 makes that page messy well the thing is uh, i love louise simonson but her one weakness is stuff like this like if you go to Mm -hmm. digital page four the bottom left panel Julie Powers says, if people saw us use our powers, they think we're mutants. And then Katie says, but we're not, Julie. We weren't born with our powers. Whitey came from space and he gave them to us. Uh, Well, Julie already knows that because she was part of that story, right? Right. So that information is strictly for the reader. But I can forgive it because I'm used to it. Um, But yeah, ideally, that kind of stuff would be cut out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But... So yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, but I enjoyed it. I don't think it's my favorite issue of Power Pack yet, to be honest. Um, I think some of the other ones were better, but I definitely enjoyed it. So I recommend it. Uh, Mara, do you recommend this issue? Um, only if you have nothing else to read, I would say. <laughs> it, doesn't say <laughs> okay. a, it doesn't say a lot about it, but I have not also read most of Power Pack. I think this is the first Power Pack issue I've read, so I have no basis for a comparison. So um, proceed with caution with my advice. <laughs> Okay, and Josh, what about you? Yeah, I think I I think I would recommend this. Um, uh, if if somebody's interested in, in reading Power Pack, um, this is definitely a good introduction because it's like a popular character that everybody is kind of familiar with. So it's kind of like an easy in. Um, it is kind of in the middle of a story, I guess. That's kind of weird because all of their powers are with other characters, but. Uh, yeah, I thought it. I thought it worked as a standalone story by itself. So um, I'd recommend this one. Awesome! Some more recommendations from Power Pack from at least two of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so now we are going to move over to Marvel Fanfare Thirty Two. And Josh, you're going to tell us what happened in this one. Right. Okay. So um, first thing that happens is we are introduced to this super villain who um is extremely um uh he he this character um is racist yeah it's it's a it's a (laughs) racist depiction of a uh of an asian character who Honestly, shouldn't have even really been around in the 80s. This is like the late 80s and characters like this are still present in comics. And it really feels icky and gross to even read. Like, sure. Uh, 
I tried to kind of put push that to the back of my mind, but they just kept saying his name over and over again, and it just kept bringing it back. And it was like, it was really tough to read this comic. Right. Um, this character's name is the Yellow Claw. Right. And it's very uh, like, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just extremely inappropriate and uh, tough to read because it, it, even for the time, it's it it doesn't work. And um, but we're again we're re- reviewing this and reading this because um, it is part of Marvel history, and it I think it's important to um, still read and talk about this and just sure. uh, acknowledge and recognize that this is something that happened, and we need to learn from it and like do better today and kind of move past this and, and, um, you know, take this as a lesson. Sure. Um, but we see, we're kind of thrown into like the middle of this story. Um, claw has captured captain America and Frogman uh, in his hidden, uh, his hidden underground bunker. Um, he, orders his guards to throw Captain America in a dungeon and he kind of like talks to Frogman and um, interrogates him and Frogman kind of pleads innocence. So he uh, he he decides to free Frogman and let him go. Um, there's kind of like a flashback of like how Claw ha- has been around for centuries and recently he has um, put on like a disguise to disguise himself as like a guru and go on TV. And he's got like thousands and thousands of people that kind of follow him because he's made these predictions that um, he has like manufactured and they, they've kind of been wild predictions that nobody believed, but then he like sends his people out to make these predictions happen. Mm-hmm. So um that's kind of leading into his like final thing. So he's kind of like building up this character that he's portraying to win over the masses. Uh, we cut to Spider-Man. He's in the streets. He knows something is going on with Cap and Frogman. So he goes to Frogman's father and lets him know what's going on and enlists the help from him. Um, and the two of them swing over to this hidden city. Uh, we cut back to Cap. He's in the prison and this, guy (laughs) that just shows up and doesn't really show up again um helps helps captain america out and gives him a shield and cap is able to escape this prison um at the same time frogman is kind of in the middle of this forest trying to you know navigate his way back home when he runs into these giant frogs (laughs) (laughs) these like huge frogs like that are like probably double the size of him Mm-hmm. Um, and he thinks that they're going to eat him. He thinks that we're, they're going to eat him, um, but it turns out that they kind of see him as one of them. So uh, he kind of enlists their help to stop the claw. We cut over to kind of this, um, the beginning of this final confrontation where the claw shows up in his like persona to like thousands and thousands of people in this giant arena. And he kind of starts this pep talk and he puts on this helmet and it starts hypnotizing the entire crowd. Uh, Captain America shows up and rips off his mask and it turns out it's too late. Uh, the crowd has already been turned and they've kind of, they're kind of already brainwashed. Um, and because he has their like, mind energy he's able to kind of like have this extra superpower where this giant like spectral claw comes out of his helmet and he starts hitting uh captain america and fighting him with it that's when frogman shows up with all of his gigantic frogs uh spider-man the x-men uh they also kind of hop in and start saving the day um Cap is able to smash uh, the helmet off of Claw's head and Claw escapes. And uh, Frogman is reunited with his dad who unmasks him at the end of the comic. Uh, And yeah, that's that's Marvel fanfare. (laughs) That's what happens in that story. It's kind of how it ends (laughs) as Claw gets away. Now, Uh, I should quickly point out this is written and drawn 
by our pals from Marvel Team Up. I don't know if you noticed that. J.M. Dematias and Carrie Gamble. Feels Remember like these it. guys? It What's feels that? like it. Yeah. Uh, J.M. Dematias wrote most of the Marvel Team Ups we did. And Carrie Gamble, he was the one drawing the ones. You remember that story with Turner D. Century? Oh, man. Yeah. yeah, that was Carrie Gamble. So, you know, this has a classic Marvel feel. I enjoy reading it. It's fun. I love, what is his name? Frog Boy? Frogman is great. Frogman. I love him. Becca but, would have loved the yeah, parts with him, bad. the giant frogs and everything. Yeah. But, I mean, beyond the yellow claw stuff, the problem I had with this, as well as all J.M. Dematia's comics around this time, it's way too wordy. Like, when I look at a page, I go, oh, my God, I have to read this. I just, and I, and I, and I you know, <laughs> trudge my way through it, and I read it. <laughs> And some of it's fun and some of it's good, but it just makes me not want to read it again for sure. Like, it's not a bad comic, but it's kind of like just go through and cut out 50% of the dialogue and the and the captions, and then it'll be so much better. That's my take on it. Mara, what did you think? Yeah, same. Um, just like the first uh, power pack, the power pack that we read, um, there's just way too much dialogue. Like, I believe in visuals portraying stories. Right. So there was just way too much dialogue. Um, I think the Frogman character was um, a nice little kind of childish twist to it. Not childish uh-huh. in a bad way, but more, you know, youthful twist to it, which um, he's not like, he's almost like Spider-Man because he's young or, or he's youngish. Sure. Um, so that was kind of fun. Um, I did like the color, actually, the coloring. Coloring was very nice for the comics. Um, as far as the story goes, like uh, Josh mentioned, it is quite. Um, it did not age well because <laughs> because um, the yellow, the yellow claw. He was portraying someone that has like an Indian name, and he was still drawn to be like like a very typical or stereotypical Chinese man. Right. right? Um, and then I did read after the fact that the Indian character that he was portraying that was supposed to be the face is it it means God, Sir God happiness, but it's an Indian. So sure. it just didn't compute to me all of it right. um, in the end. But like Josh, I also tried to like overlook that fact. But um, other than that, though, I think it was mm. um, an enjoyable enough read apart from you know, the the character not aging well. Right. Uh, so, Josh, what did you think of this one? Yeah, uh, again, uh, kind of echoing what you both have already said. There, There's definitely some enjoyable parts. Uh, I like that it's a little bit more fast-paced, too. Like, we don't have mm-hmm. to linger too much on a certain character to, like, over-explain why, why they're here or what's going on. They kind of just, like go through the story they don't have to stop and uh, like explain why the x-men are here now because it's like obviously that happened in like the previous issue but it doesn't take away from anything that happens sure um even like how spider-man knows they don't have to stop and re-explain like you remember when spider-man figured out that captain america was in trouble by getting the signal you know they just kind Mm -hmm. of like you know they're it's very efficient which is um more than I can say for a lot of other stories that are like this, that kind of sure, have just sure. like tons of characters. Um, but again, this this villain is like a hard pill to swallow. Like it's it's really tough uh, reading a story with him when he's depicted in this way. Um, right, right. Uh, but yeah, it's lovely to see Frogman. He's one of our favorite characters on Spider Cast. Um, so. Or yeah. any podcast, right? I, yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, kind of any, a requirement to have a podcast now. Yeah, any podcast I'm on from <laughs> now on, I'm going to bring up Frogman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, here's the thing is, uh, okay, so we didn't really talk about the art. Mara, did you like the art by Carrie Gamble? I did, actually. I, I I actually enjoyed, like, the art itself. And I did mention that I like the colors as well. So it oh, right, complemented, right. complemented each other quite nicely. Yeah, it kind of has that classic comic book feel, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, again, Kerry Gamble is definitely a solid artist. He's never been my favorite, but I think the more that I see his stuff from this era, I do respect him, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised how much I liked um, 
the look of this one, considering mm-hmm. it's a uh, like a draw over, like a the, um, like a recoloring. Yeah, of the issue. like can't... it's it's not a scan. No, so... you know what? I'm gonna say um, the thing is, is Marvel Fanfare was printed on shiny paper even in the 1980s, so it's possible right. this is the original. Well, yeah, you're you're right. Yeah, I don't see any ads or anything though. Like it's definitely a reprint. Well, Marvel Fanfare didn't have ads. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So it's it's. I'm not sure if it's uh, a recolor or not, but yeah, I know what you're saying. Like it does have the. Cl- Either way, it's got the classic feel. They yeah. Didn't, like yeah. fix it if they did. Mm-hmm. So here's the thing. Yeah, I, I give this a mild recommendation. It is a classic issue, but I do wish they would have trimmed out some of this dialogue and narration. Um, Mara, do you recommend this one? Uh, <laughs> I, um, no comment. <laughs> okay, no comment. That's our first no comment. Okay. Okay. Uh, d- and Josh, what do you think? No, it, it, it's Ooh. it's really tough to recommend something like this uh, with kind of the... The content uh, of, of what's here, and especially today, it's like it. I don't know. It's yeah. Okay. No comment. No comment. <laughs> Two no comments. All right. All right. So this is yeah. This is a weird one, folks, because our third story. Um, this is actually okay. So for those that don't know, Marvel Tales is a series that reprinted Spider-Man comics. Just completely ran at random. It was never in any kind of order. It was kind of just whatever they felt like doing that month. Um, this is, I believe, the only issue of the entire series that had an original story at the back. And that's why we chose to do this one. And so this backup story is a very short story featuring Spider-Man and the Thing. And Mara, you're going to tell us what happens in this one. Sure. So I really like this read. Um, I like that it was short and sweet, too. Um, so it starts off basically with Spider-Man and the thing just going at each other. But it looked like they, they made it look like the thing was going after Spider-Man. So it continues on as as you read, like you'll see for sure that um, the thing is attacking Spider-Man. And then you're wondering, like, what the thing? Um, and then eventually they keep going at it with each other. Um, there's a part here I really enjoyed where um, Spider-Man disguised himself as <laughs> some, mm-hmm. th- something else. And it was very fun, that part. I really enjoyed that. But really a lot of a lot of it is them going at each other. And then eventually the Fantastic Four shows up. And then that's when we, uh, we are told that um, the thing is actually being mind controlled by the puppet master. Mm-hmm. So that's why he was going after Spider-Man. Um, because apparently the puppet master, uh, Spider-Man is one of the only uh, people that the puppet master can't catch or something like that. And then once the Fantastic Four arrives, they explain what's going on. And then um, uh, lo and behold, the thing is out of, <laughs> he's he's mm-hmm. back to being the thing. So they didn't really explain that part, I, I don't think um but yeah I basically think it really yeah. just kind of zaps him with a ray or something mm-hmm. <laughs> right yeah. yeah so yeah and then once that happens then they're back to being friends again i guess <laughs> 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 well, that's pretty much it right yeah very short and sweet i really enjoyed it i i, I really liked it so here's the thing shally fish the writer is currently still this month still working he's writing mostly mm. kids comics he writes uh, Scooby Doo meets Batman. He did some other stuff before that. He did uh, a, a run of backup issues on Action Comics. So that's pretty much his forte: is these fun little stories, mostly for kids. Um, James Fry, he was never a big artist, but I know him from I think Spider Man and Iron Man around this time. So not a great artist, but I do think this issue was fun. And that mm-hmm. gag that you mentioned, where Spider Man is dressed up in the trench coat, I thought that was funny. Mm-hmm. You know. And so I definitely don't think this story is profound, but if you need to fill, you know, five or six pages, there's worse ways you could do it. So I thought it was fine for what it was, you know. Uh, Josh, what did you think? I loved it. I had yeah. so much fun reading it. Yeah, it's good. It's just like a cute little quick story. Nothing too crazy happens, but I really love the dynamic between Spider-Man and the thing. Um, I love seeing uh 
Spidey like do different things to like fight thing. Like again, like you guys said before with the disguise, I thought it was a really funny bit. Um, right after that, he like makes a homemade slingshot by webbing two walls in an alleyway and grabbing a trash can trash and like can. pulling it back to fling at the, the thing. Right. And it's like, there's some really fun stuff. There's like a sculpture. It looks like a famous sculpture. Like I think I, I recognize this, but it's like a cube. Uh, like a giant a Rubik's cube looking thing mm-hmm. up on it one corner and thing uh, to try to get uh, uh, to try to get Spider-Man who's on top of it. He rips it out and he spins it like a top and it ends up crashing into a building like there's some really fun things in this like four or five page little story where not a whole lot uh, happens. So uh, I was like dragged in and like completely invested the entire time. Um, so yeah, I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. And I think it just shows that Shelly fish knows how to do more of like humor strips. Like he knows how to pace out, you know, like gag after gag after gag. Right. Whereas mm-hmm. Morgan, he, he's, it, this isn't, there's no exposition. There's no like flashbacks. It's just a very simple, straightforward story. So yeah, I really like that. Um, so Mara, did you mention the art? Did you like the art in this one? I absolutely adored the art. The art was definitely way up my alley. Um, and the texture, this at least this copy that you sent us, um, it looked very vintage because of the colors. Um, I don't know. It, it looks like it's on yellowish paper. Yeah. So the colors were more pastel-y. So I love pastel. So that the color was just beautiful. And like I, like I said, the art was definitely my my kind of art basically for comic books um but yeah well now here's a question while we're talking about it because this is a scan from the original comics would you rather see if you were going to buy a thick hardcover comic book reprint would you rather see a scan of the newsprint comics on yellow paper with those dots or would you rather see everything recolored on a computer oh original so the yellow paper, definitely the yellow paper. I love them. Right. I think the more that we read these recolored comics, I, I, I tend to think the same thing. It's kind of like a movie, you know, like when you watch a classic movie, they might remaster yeah. it, but they don't change the color ideally. No. Right. So maybe that's yeah. what they should do is just reprint it the way it was. What do you think, Josh? Yeah, I think that um, a combination of both is probably best. You mm-hmm. you you want to um, scan in the originals and use those, but it's always not going to be perfect. Like it's not going to be a one to one from the scan to what right. you uh, uh, f- from the original to the scan. So going back and kind of touching everything back up and stretching it, and putting it in back into like its proper shape, I think is great. Um, cleaning up any like artifacts and stuff like that, but leaving the textures and the colors and the line work exactly how it was originally is definitely the way to go. And the thing is, is back in these days, there was a lot of coloring mistakes, like literally going outside the lines. Right. Mm-hmm. So they would definitely have to clean up stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think uh, a good, like a hybrid between the two would be perfect, right? Yeah. So yeah. there you go. So the question is, I know this isn't a full issue, but Mara, do you recommend this story for other people to read? 100%. And I think I'm going to go back and read like the actual whole, uh, the whole issue. Um, one, 100 to 1,000%, I recommend it. Oh, nice. And just so you know, this uh, this the original story is by Chris Claremont and John Byrne, famous for doing X Men. So, and I haven't read this one, but I'm sure that it's good. Okay, so yeah, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Josh, do you recommend this one? Yeah, this one was super fun. Um, definitely my favorite bunch uh, of the three that we've read. Um, again, it's nice and short. You could finish it in like honestly 30 seconds. You could like skim through it no problem and it's a uh-huh. uh, really fun story with some like uh creative art and like again new ways for like spidey and thing to kind of like take punches at each other instead of right. just it turning into like pow 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 and then uh, issue done so yeah uh, i would i would recommend this one awesome so unfortunately, that wraps up this week's episode. Uh, Mara, we want to thank you so much for joining us again. We'd love thank to have you, you back on again one day. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'd love to be back. 
That's great. Awesome. Um, and hopefully next time you come, Becca and Julie will be here. They couldn't be with us this week, but who knows? I'm sure next time they'll be fine. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Oh, I want to talk about next week, for those that are paying attention. Uh, next week we're going to be reviewing Web of Spider-Man 23 with the return of Slide. Amazing Spider-Man 285, which is the Gang War Part 2, featuring a guest appearance by the Punisher. And Peter Parker, the spectacular Spider-Man 123, which features the return of Blaze. And our, retur- and our <laughs> returning guest will be Andrew Helmer, so be sure to join oh, us nice. next week. And Josh, you can take it from here. Yeah, we want to thank you guys so much, the listeners at home, for uh, taking a look at our podcast. Uh, it really helps when you leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts, or you can leave us a, a comment or a tweet on Twitter at, at HCT Spidercast. Um, please let us know what you guys think about the comics we're talking about and the podcast itself. Uh, we want to keep that comics conversation going. That's right. So until next week, see you later. Bye.